Hi, this is Chuck Rice. I'd like to welcome you to this month's presidential message for the Oklahoma City Astronomy Club. Normally, we would be meeting at the Science Museum Oklahoma, but there was an event conflict. So this time, we actually went on a little field trip, and we'll be down at the University of Oklahoma, um, hosted by Professor Kerry Magruder, and we're going to look at the History of Science collection and some of their fantastic manuscripts uh, that they have. We did this a few years ago. Uh, I think it was I'm trying to think at the time, maybe three or four years BCE. That would be before COVID era. And we looked at their uh, Galileo's World exhibit, and you got to see a bunch of Galileo manuscripts and other important manuscripts from the time. So Kerry's going to bring those out again and show them to us again. So hopefully you guys can make it down. Um, it's going to be pretty informal. So may not be any merchandise to buy or anything like that, but I encourage you to go out to the discussion board and the website and to look for those items as well. Um, and also to renew your membership as well. You can now do that online. So um, there'll still be a lot of things going on. Um, check the discussion board. Um, so yeah, so we won't have a lot of announcements in person other than where to go see them in the museum library up on the fifth floor. Um, one of the things that I'm going to regret about this month's meeting is, um, unfortunately, Mike Brake passed away and he won't be able to join us, so obviously, and that's very, very sad because Mike was a fantastic person, really loved books, really loved the libraries, and so he was always a great asset for these types of field trips. Um, but yeah, so it'll be fun, it'll be exciting. Uh, there's hideaway pizza afterwards and everything, so come down to Norman and enjoy the nice weather. Um, I was looking around and I can share the screen here. Let's see, Let's share this. So this is a YouTube video that's live from JPL and it's at their spacecraft assembly facility. And so it's kind of mesmerizing. You can just sit there and watch it. Um, you've probably seen things on the internet, you know, Cameras set up to watch eagle, uh, eaglets in a nest, and and the mother and father eagles as they come back to the nest, or various wildlife cameras or uh, construction cameras or things like that. Well, this is at NASA's JPL, and there's actually activity in there today, and somebody's waving at the camera or uh, just waving at somebody else. I don't know, but I'm not exactly sure what they're putting together, but it is kind of cool. Um, so if you're ever need a few minutes of rest and relaxation, go ahead and watch those cameras. And then the other thing I thought I would do is uh, show you the what's up highlights that they have. So let's see what they have to say. What's up for April? Mercury rising, this month's moon and planet pairings and the lyrid meteor shower. First up on April 11th, the planet Mercury smallest and fastest moving of the planets in our solar system will reach its highest and most visible in the evening sky for the year. Mercury is only visible in the sky for a few weeks every three to four months. The rest of the time, it's too close to the sun in the sky and is lost in its bright glare. And since the planet orbits so close to the sun, it's always near the sun in the sky, appearing low near the horizon for no more than an hour or two, either following sunset or preceding sunrise. Some of Mercury's fleeting appearances, known as apparitions, are better for observing than others, for a combination of reasons that have to do with how our view of the solar system changes with the seasons, what hemisphere you're in, and what phase the planet happens to be showing us at the time. For this apparition in the northern hemisphere, the best viewing is April 3rd through the 11th, as the planet appears higher in the sky each evening. It quickly fades in brightness after that as the phase it's showing us becomes an increasingly slimmer crescent. Also on April 11th, you'll find the planet Venus right next to the Pleiades star cluster. The two will be close enough to appear in the same field of view through the night years. This pairing makes for a fun reminder that the night sky is kind of like a time machine. The farther out in space you look, the farther back in space you're seeing. On that night, you're seeing light that left Venus about nine minutes earlier whereas the light of the Pleiades left those stars around 400 years ago. The latter half of April includes some awesome close approaches of the moon with three of the bright planets in the sky. 
On April 15th and 16th, you'll find the crescent moon rising with Saturn. Find them low in the southeastern sky in a couple of hours before sunrise. Then on the evening of the 23rd, find the slim crescent moon hanging just five degrees above Venus in the west after sunset. And on April 25th, the moon finds its way over to Mars, high up in the west after dark. At this time, around the 26th and 27th, the moon will be at its first quarter phase, meaning it appears as a half moon high in the sky after dark. The first quarter moon is a great time to pull out your binoculars or telescope if you have them, as it's an ideal time to observe the moon's craters and mountains along the Terminator, day-night boundary, leads. Lots of astronomy clubs plan public observing nights around this time as well, and you can look for events in your area with NASA's Night Sky Network. April brings the annual Lyrid Meteor Shower. It's a medium-strength shower that can produce up to 20 meteors per hour at its peak under ideal conditions. The Lyrids peak this year in the pre-dawn hours of April 23rd, though you should see a few shooting stars on the morning before and after the peak as well. Fortunately, the peak falls just a couple of days after the new moon. That means the moon won't interfere with this year's Lyrids, overwhelming fainter meteors in a glow of moonlight. The Lyrids are named for the constellation Lyra, which is near the point in the sky where their meteors appear to come from, called the Radiant. They're one of the oldest known meteor showers, with the first recorded sighting in China some 2,700 years ago. They originate as dust particles from a comet during its 400-year orbit around the sun. The Lyrids tend to produce fast-moving meteors that lack persistent trails, but they can also produce the occasional bright, they call a fireball. To observe them, find a comfortable spot away from bright city lights, get horizontal, and look straight up. You'll see the most meteors by looking slightly away from the origin point, which is near the bright star Vega. And here's wishing you clear skies to catch a few shooting stars one April morning, and the forecast calls for light showers of comet dust with a chance of fireballs. Here are the phases of the moon for April. Stay up to date with all of NASA's missions to explore the solar system and beyond at NASA.gov. I'm President Dykes from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and that's what's up for this month. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. So um, I'm looking forward to that, and hopefully you will too. A um, lot of exciting things going on. We're getting into great observing time with the weather, um, temperatures, all that great stuff. Not a lot of bugs are out yet. Um, you know, in the fall, there's a lot of insects looking for last minute meals before they, they go into hibernation or die. Whereas in the spring, they really haven't emerged yet. So it's been pretty dry, so very few bugs. So I'm looking forward to observing and being out in the night sky and hopefully you are too. So anyway, make it down to Norman, be safe and we'll see you around. Okay, bye-bye.